Thanks very much, Joe. Appreciate it. And it's great to see uh, uh, old friends in the audience. Uh, this is only the second time I've been to a CSTE meeting. And uh, the last one, I'm sorry to say, was 20 years ago. So I very much appreciate Tim's invitation to join you and uh, bridge, the, bridge the, the, the gulf between the, us academic epidemiologists and you uh, real epidemiologists. Um, I, 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 Tim has a sense of humor, so he gave me a, a topic called making gains. Two words, making gains. So the first thing you do when you have a topic you can't discuss is you put a subtitle on the topic. <laughs> and uh, and uh, then after I finished putting the subtitle on the topic, I realized it was hopelessly grandiose. So I had a, two choices, call Tim and argue with him or just do my best. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about the future. and. Um, I'd like to talk about methods, what approaches will enable substantial gains in epidemiology and public health. I'd like to talk a little bit about topics, some of the major public health threats that demand our attention, uh, and then end with a few challenges alongside the inher in, 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 inherent, not inherent, scientific challenges. What are the key uh, opportunities and obstacles? So I think we know where we fit on the continuum of um, research and investigation in our discipline. We're not basic scientists. Those f folks are figuring out how things work at a fundamental level, often at a molecular level. Um, we may touch base with clinical discovery in engaging our clinicians, um, uh, and we certainly can engage uh, in clinical application of discovery, and that's sort of that T1 interface, translational research between the bench to the bedside. But this slide, starting with the clinical, I think we get into the field of public health discovery. What are the ideologies of diseases? Uh, what motivates people to act? Uh, what interventions work? Um, application, what interventions are effect efficacious, cost effective? Um, policy discovery, how do we bring programs to scale? And policy application, how do we get discovery into practice given competing demands, the realities of political and economic realities? And I think of this as T2 research, from what we know about human health from a sort of clinical perspective into public health and prevention application. Um, and that's where 98% of us in this room fit. So thinking about methods, you know, today's public health schools, I, I looked at a few websites and sort of looked at departmental names. And they all have the classical disciplines uh, described in various terms. So we've got our behavioral and social sciences, health promotion, we've got our biostatistics, our environmental health sciences, epidemiology, and uh, health policy administration, whatever is call, called in different names at different institutions. And many schools have cross-cutting themes, maternal child health, global health, ethics, health communications, nutrition, many, many others. But I think that the interdisciplinarity of our, of our field is uh, looming large, and uh, a term you're going to hear a lot about at this conference and elsewhere is the, fee is the term implementation science. So the science of healthcare delivery and the scale up of services. Quality improvement science, something that we've borrowed heavily from our business and engineering friends. Uh, access to health and the health disparities that continue to plague our system. Adherence to preventive and therapeutic regimens, it's all about adherence, isn't it? It's great when we can do something like a clean water system and all you have to do is turn on the tap. But so many of our interventions require saying yes to a vaccine, uh, saying no to a food product, uh, and requires adherence. And then, of course, uh, the whole field of decision analysis modeling of cost effectiveness has been loomed large because we're in an era of um, resource constraints. We're obligated to make our arguments to the uh, fiscal managers in the political side in a way that perhaps in a bygone era we weren't uh, uh, um, being asked to justify uh, our existence quite that extensively. Another field is climate science. And um, I was uh, finishing uh, my uh, coffee at home this morning and uh, on uh, NPR came uh, uh, a report about Norfolk, Virginia, and, uh, and uh, they interviewed a gentleman whose house is getting routinely flooded, and he waxed eloquent about how he didn't believe in climate change, and 
uh, he thought it was all overblown and that you know, he, it, was just, it was just the vicissitudes and variations of Mother Earth. I mean, he sounded like, sounded like some of my old California friends, you know, Mother Earth, all this, but it was a very strange viewpoint for somebody whose home is getting flooded. Uh, and this, of course, involves climatologists. We're talking to astrophysicists in this field, people who have satellite data, uh, vector biologists, uh, hydrologists, agronomists, veterinarians, many, many others. Uh, and then, of course, when we think about maternal, child, and infant health, there's the whole philosophy of the life course. So many uh, problems of adults being more or less predicted by, um, by uh, early childhood experiences, the whole field of male engagement. Um, uh, we are deeply uh, obsessed with this in our PEPFAR work overseas because uh, so often the men are either helping or hurting the women to access care. And then issues around task shifting and health workforce. I'm a pediatrician in my first life, and one of the more satisfying working relationships I ever had was with a nurse practitioner and a nurse. We were a team of three in a storefront clinic in um, the Inwood area of northern Manhattan. And uh, we were all speaking Spanish all day long, and, uh, and we just had an amazing working relationship. And there was so much that the nurse and the nurse practitioner did better than I, and there were some things that I did better than they, and it was such an efficient model, it's sort of amazing that this was sort of 25, 30 years ago, and we still don't, haven't evolved quite to that level of uh, efficiency in our health workforce. So let's shift from methods to topics. What are major public health threats that demand our attention? And I'll stick with my own favorite theme, women's maternal, child, and infant health. We have this issue of male engagement, gender power disparities. Uh, in many of the countries where I work, the gender power disparities are um, overwhelming, uh, and it's, it's a continuous struggle to um, empower women to, for their own uh, preventive health care. Uh, we have a rising rate of preterm births in the United States, and the amazing thing is we don't understand it. Uh, health over the life course I mentioned, and then task shifting and health workforce issues loom large. I did a body of work in the knots to the 2000, 2010 in Zambia, and uh, as you recall, uh, single-dose nevirapine uh, was reported in the Lance in the late 90s to uh, reduce transmission mother to infant by 50%. And this was very compelling because we were in a very, very undercapacitated uh, healthcare system where the zydovidine dose, which is a couple thousand dollars worth of drug, it included an inter intravenous two gram bolus at delivery, it just wasn't practical for our setting. So we got very excited about the single dose nevirapine, but we had to have women access antenatal care. And there were plenty of women delivering at home who didn't come into antenatal care, especially in the rural areas. We had to offer them the interventions, so antenatal care had to have the voluntary counseling and testing and nevirapine available. Uh, the women had to agree to uptake the intervention. They had to agree to take the, the, the pill and take it home with them. Uh, then they had to remember to take the pill in labor, and then the postpartum nurses had to know which babies were born to positive women and, and dose them. So it sounded very, very easy on the surface, ended up being an immensely complex um, health services delivery research endeavor. And when we started out, we were very proud of our program, and we found that 90% of the mothers were um, offered testing, 80% of them agreed and took the pill home, 60% of them actually took the pill in labor, and 70% uh, of the nurses gave the proper child the proper postpartum dose of nevirapine. But you multiply that, that's only 30% program coverage. And that came as quite a shock, because if you'd asked us, we would have guessed 60, 65 percent. So we were overestimating our coverage by a factor of two in the absence of data. And we, we used uh, cord blood nevirapine to really get a handle on that. That cost some money to do that test. It was the only way we could really figure out adherence. And uh, once we knew how bad we were, we were able to improve. And we managed to improve about 10 percent per year coverage. And, uh, and um, the coverage estimates in Lusaka, Zambia now are somewhere in the 80% range. So the value of implementation science, the value of quality improvement research. Now this is not meant to be read. I just want to point out that, that this was the follow-up study that my, my fellows and colleagues did. 
in uh, Zambia, two uh, venues in South Africa, Cote d'Ivoire and Cameroon. And the only thing I want to point out to you is the black bars are successful prophylaxis. In other words, they carried it through that whole, that whole cascade. And every one of the colored bars is one program deficit or another. So different countries, different clinics, and each line is a clinic. So different countries, different clinics had different failings. And the answer is you've got to do this clinic by clinic by clinic. Figure out what is wrong at the given clinic. Is it that they're not getting tested? Is it that they, uh, the, there's some obstacle in the community, maybe the men, maybe the mothers-in-law, who uh, are discouraging the women from actually uh, saying yes to the testing or saying yes to the nivirapine? Do they get home and they forget to take the medicine? Do we need to help them at that level? Do we have dysfunction in the postpartum clinic where the nurses can't, are not identifying the children properly? And this is hard work, clinic by clinic by clinic to do this quality improvement work. We've worked in Mozambique in recent years uh, with PEPFAR support uh, and uh, this is a typical rural clinic, no electricity, don't be fooled by the wires above the clinic. There are no wires going to the clinic because they can't, they can't pay their electricity bill. There's no running water, there's one junior nurse, she's sticking her head out from that window and minimal supplies or medicines. And when we saw this study uh, from the South Africans, the SHARE study, a study of optimal time of initiation of ART, ART in uh, uh, HIV infected South African infants, it was very obvious that identifying the infant at six weeks of age with PCR and treating them right away was the only serious option in terms of the children for whom PMTCT had failed. The children who actually got infected had to be treated early, and you see the results right there. The uh, early ART group, death or treatment failure, much, much lower rate than the deferred ART group. And deferred ART was the WHO recommended standard at the time where the children had dropped below a certain threshold of CD4, analogous to what we, you know, what, what, what was done for adults. So the kids, uh, and now we appreciate the adults too, ought to be treated early and definitively. And we looked at our own program in Mozambique and we were only covering 25% of those infants with early infant diagnosis. Now if you're only getting 25% of your kids back for that PCR at six weeks of age, you aren't starting the cascade, you're not even beginning. And so we took a look at the process map, and I apologize, this is hard to read in the back. So it's just, it's just basically, where, where do I point? I point over here, well, forget about pointing. So um, it's, it's what you would expect in any maternity ward. You, uh, the woman presents, uh, her HIV status is ascertained. If she's positive, she gets prophylaxis, the infant's delivered, prophylaxis is given to the infant, and then she's counseled and referred to the early infant diagnosis program as well as the program for her own care, and then she's discharged. And then when she comes back in a month or six weeks, the infant's enrolled, the record's initiated, the infant's examined, PCR test is drawn, counseling is given, she's discharged. And most of these clinics are only about 50 meters of a dusty courtyard separating the postpartum care from where we were enrolling the kids. So it wasn't particularly logistically complex. But this is the system that wasn't working. This is the system that only covered 25%. So there was something desperately wrong, and it was a medical student that we sent uh, out to investigate this that came back with the answer. And she said, uh, uh, based on uh, interviews with nurses and patients, and this is going to really shock you, the, the reason they didn't come, they didn't understand what they were being told. They didn't understand what they were being told. Um, Mozambique... Um, like many African countries, is a, um, is a product of colonial interests and power dynamics. And uh, it's not uncommon for tribal groups to be split right down the middle by the Malawian border or by the Tanzanian border or whatever. And um, since there's so many language groups and so many tribal groups in Mozambique, it's the um, philosophy of the uh, country's leaders to try to knit that country together and very typically a nurse or a doctor who's just graduated is then deployed to another province, not where they live or work. And uh, they don't speak the local language of that, local, of that province. They speak their own local language of their own tribal group. So they speak Portuguese, but the median 
educational level of the women in Zambezia province where we work in north central Mozambique is two years of formal education. And I've been to those schools. That's 50 kids in a classroom and a teacher standing there. A teacher is typically 18 years old is standing there reading a book. The kids don't have a book. They don't have a pen. They don't have a paper. And they learn the most rudimentary Portuguese after two years, enough to maybe negotiate in the marketplace. That's it. And so the message that we're giving them is, you have HIV infection. This is a virus. You're going to need treatment the rest of your life. And by the way, your child is exposed to HIV. We're not sure if they're positive yet. So we're going to have to do a, a nucleic acid amplification test at six weeks of age. We're going to need to have you come back. And we need to see. We can't tell you if your baby's infected or not. But maybe the baby's infected, in which case we're going to have to treat the baby for the rest of their life. With this. I mean, come on. This is all in Portuguese. And they didn't get it. So what we did was went there and, with the nurse's help, decided that the process map was going to be shifted. After the prophylaxis is given postpartum, at the time of typical discharge, we weren't going to discharge them. We were going to walk them to the clinic. We were going to register them in the clinic, explain in the local language what the, why they had to come back and when they had to come back, and then we were going to discharge them, and then they would come back. And what happened? We went from 25% coverage to 75% coverage. So this hard work of quality improvement can pay off. And one systemic modification of a program can do more than any single clinician talking until they're blue in the face if you can figure these out and fix the system. So another topic is population rise and urbanization alongside the demographics of aging. We have our challenges of diet and exercise, global obesity, diabetes expansion. Um, the worst country in the world for diabetes in the next 20 years is going to be India. Mind-boggling increases in, in the proportion of diabetes, uh, the attendant uh, heart and health implications. So we have discovery and interventional challenges. We have policy issues. I don't know about you. I'm, how many of you are over the age of 60? Raise your hand. Come on. Don't be shy. Not as many as I had hoped. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so we went to school, and we had recess every day. And you looked forward to that. And you ran off steam for half an hour. And the fat kids and the skinny kids, and we all ran off our steam. And we had gym class, most of us every day, the least of us three times a week. And you got into your gym clothes, and you were it was dodgeball and basketball, and I mean, do you know that a lot of kids have no recess and no gym class at all? A perfunctory one day a week? What is it about our society that has created that kind of systematic change in an era of epidemic obesity? That we are embracing a sedentary lifestyle for our kids in school. I don't think it's going to help their educational prospects either. Uh, what about the failure to build neighborhoods uh, to be friendly to bicycles or uh, walkers or uh, stairs? You know, I cannot walk from the seventh floor to the eighth floor of the building that, where I work at Vanderbilt. Because of security issues, it's not a Vanderbilt building, it's a rented building. And security issues, they don't let us walk. So I'm, I'm pressing the elevator button to go one floor. Do I feel stupid or what? And, uh, and it's, it's, it's these systemic areas that uh, need tremendous work. We still have a tremendous need for ongoing epidemiologic discovery. We've got uh, innovative behavioral interventions that are, are looming. Uh, this uh, IMB model seems to show promise. We have diseases on the rise, diabetes, chikungunya. Uh, there was an article in New York Times uh, related to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis that Bill Schaffner drew my attention to, and I thought I'd mention that. HIV is now uh, manageable chronic diseases, so we find our HIV folks with, with non-communicable disease consequences, which loom large. All sorts of new stuff emerging. Just have to go down to your poster session downstairs to, to see some of those. Now, take a look at global population. Since 1959, global population doubled in 40 years, from 3 to uh, 6 billion. The growth, growth rate, which you see on the right, it is your right, uh, is, uh, is declining. But when you have a, de when you have a declining glow growth rate, but the denominator is vast, you still have a tremendous addition of people into your population. Everybody in this room gets that. And so 
um, it's going to take 45 years to increase by 50%. So that's good news, right? The 50% is not good, good news. The fact that growth rate is slowed is good news. So, but the, the reality uh, of that is that in the next 30 years, we're going to add two persons for every seven we now have on the planet. And that is projecting continued declining growth rate. That is a conservative estimate. Could be worse than this. So we've got urbanization challenges with a tremendous influx of persons from rural to urban areas. Uh, we have resource constraints, water, air, land, food. You know, more than 50% of all the food in the United States is now imported. We never thought we would get there. We never thought more than 50% of the consumed food in the United States would be imported. So tremendous food uh, uh, safety challenges. Energy demands, oil, coal, gas, climate change. And what does this mean for public health? Crowding morbidities, water shortage illnesses, vector expansion because of uh, warm, warming climates, and increased person-to-person -person contact rates. Prevention means human health in its broadest sense, and we are going to be constrained severely by our resources. I don't think this audience needs to see the obesity trends, but uh, uh, you know when the colors all change in 20 years, and every single state jumps at least two colors in terms of the proportion of, of adult, U.S. adults who are obese, you know that you're in trouble. The latest uh, slide from CDC has changed the color scheme altogether. They, they've, they, you don't even see those lower categories. They just abandon those. And now they've added greater than or equal to 35%. Nobody's in that category yet. No state is in that category. But, uh, but we'll, we'll see. So the, the, the unambiguously uh, a major challenge for the future. How about emerging infectious diseases? The antibiotic resistance agenda is something many of you deal with as a, an everyday challenge in the states. And the uh, um, um, pandemic flu has been a, uh, a looming nightmare, uh, which uh, we know, reading our history books, could if it were uh, anything half as bad as the Spanish influenza of 1918, 1919, uh, we know we have to be better prepared. Continued high HIV, STI, TB incidents. I mean, we have um, uh, TB declining in the US, but it's uh, going up in many parts of the world. Uh, STI rates uh, are um, declining for gonorrhea and increasing for chlamydia. Uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere, uh, HIV continues to be a major challenge for us. Uh, climate science I've already mentioned, and then the important point here is that we expect more emerging infections directly related to uh, climate warming, vector-borne disease in particular, dengue, West Nile, chikungunya, and others. So these are two slides I, don't, I wish I could point, but if you just look at the uh, black line uh, on the left and compare it to that greenish line just to the right. It's about a dozen days in terms of um, uh, temperature difference between 20 and 26 degrees centigrade. So that if you are at 26 degrees centigrade, you're going to pupate a dozen days, a dozen days earlier than at that lower temperature. And that's the phenomenon of uh, mosquitoes. They not only uh, reproduce faster, uh, in warmer climates, but, and, and, and you have greater vec uh, vectoral capacity as a consequence, but you also um, live longer, uh, and uh, more of the mosquitoes live longer, and for malaria that's very important because uh, the malaria parasite may take eight to 12 days, depending on which species, to, uh, to conduct its life cycle in the mosquito and before the mosquito is actually infectious. So a population of mosquitoes that lives an additional day can be very critical in terms of the proportion that are infectious for malaria. And an old study from Joshi et al., uh, they, they used much uh, lower temperature differences, nighttime temperature of 18 degrees uh, and, and, and daytime temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. And uh, then they just moved it up two degrees and they found a six day difference in terms of uh, full uh, pu pupation, full maturation. So the uh, longer mosquito longevity, the higher vectoral capacity, higher density, survival to infectiousness is a big problem. And people are working on this. I saw this paper just a, a few days ago and uh, downloaded the slide just to give you a sense of a temperature suitability index that's been developed by investigators at Hopkins in London 
um, uh, for malaria to quantify the impact that air temperature has on both mosquito survival and sporozoite development, so integrating these two concepts. And they're tracking the likelihood of malaria, and it's absolutely extraordinary how closely the uh, climatology models and the malaria incidence rates are, uh, are, are tracking. They're, they're, these are very good models, and it's, it's very predictable uh, how um, uh, much impact you're going to have on malaria. And we know we're in trouble with yarboviruses. What about things like tobacco marketing? Along with overweight, the major preventable cause of um, morbidity and mortality in high-income countries is tobacco. Uh, cigarette marketing expansions are going on as we speak in the low and middle income countries. There are implications, I think, of marketing of smokeless tobacco. I think we've got challenges around the implications of marijuana legalization expansion. Um, when you think about tobacco, you think about uh, chronic lung disease, you also think about cancer, and we have ongoing mysteries. Why do some women get breast cancer and others do not? Why? Uh, do we get pancreatic cancer, uh, many other, many other ongoing mysteries. We just don't understand. Uh, and then the market health disparities across social class, race, ethnicity, sex, national origin are squarely in our bailiwick in terms of our ability. So here are uh, U.S. marketing for uh, cigarettes and related products. Um, the goal is to get new smokers. So the Alive with Pleasure uh, with these vigorous young people at the beach uh, reminds me of uh, what it must look like at the Wild Horse Saloon with all you guys last night. Uh, and then you've got the woman with the skull uh, uh, um, uh, buttons uh, strategically located, uh, along with, the, I don't know what the Wheaties and the Pepsi uh, sign are, are doing there. Oh, you're always supposed to turn off your phone when you are giving a talk. And... Uh, <laughs> And then uh, the smokeless, to, uh, the, the electronic cigarettes, uh, which if you've turned on any of your cable channels lately, are being marketed aggressively with the most attractive young people you're ever going to see on the planet. So this is, the, the gloves are now off in terms of the uh, manufacturers. They don't care what agreements they made. That was for cigarettes. Now we have our electronic uh, uh, products, and, uh, and that's a great way to get people to smoke later on. Now, the, on the global side, uh, the same goal, get new smokers. So here's the United States with a declining number of uh, cigarettes uh, consumed per person, with China rising, with Russia rising, uh, the smoke famous name, the, uh, you just have to go to China and see how many men smoke. It's absolutely breathtaking, literally. And, uh, and then if you look at Asia in general, uh, Indonesia, China, Philippines, India, massive numbers of men smoking, and the companies will like nothing better than to increase the proportion of women who smoke. So how can HIV AIDS infrastructures be used to cancer patients? So we're doing a lot of this work, as Joe mentioned in his introduction. Here was just a study we did of children uh, diagnosed with cancer in Zambia. And, uh, and we had 162 uh, over two years and only 8% completed a treatment regimen. And the first journal we sent this to rejected it with a simple comment, we know this. Well, I didn't know this. I'd never done this research, didn't know the literature. But it is well known that the vast majority of children and adults in Africa who initiate cancer therapy abandon that care. Why? Well, long distance from home uh, and low maternal education were the two major contributors, not really a surprise. And I have a dream uh, that the HIV infrastructures could be useful for this. I mean, in rural Africa, um, there is one disease that, a chronic disease that we manage reasonably well. And it's not um, uh, chronic heart disease, and it's not diabetes, and it's, it's not a whole host of you know, rheumatologic uh, diseases, it's HIV. And isn't it time now that we've consolidated some of our gains with HIV to try to turn these centers of chronic disease excellence, excellence is a relative term, but anyway, um, and, and have them apply to some of these other chronic diseases. I think the opportunities are tremendous if we had the political will to do so. We've done a lot of work on cervical cancer screening. I won't go into this because I think my time is short. 
Uh, but we've focused on a nurse-led cervical cancer prevention program in Zambia using uh, visual inspection with acetic acid. We have a high-resolution uh, uh, camera. We take a picture, it pops up on the screen, so it's a di digital cervigram. The nurses look at this, they see what the lesion is, they treat it with uh, a liquid nitrogen or a, a gaseous uh, cryotherapy. If it looks bad, they refer it. And uh, we have Friday QI rounds where all of these images have been preserved, so we go through them with the nurses every Friday afternoon, and we say, yes, you managed that right, yes, you managed that right, yes, you managed oh, you wouldn't have had to treat that because it was just a squamous metaplasia. Ah, oh, you probably should have referred that. And guess what? The nurses get better than we are. They get incredibly good at this. Uh, and our QI rounds are more and more inspiring every week because the nurses get so good at what they're doing. Uh, and uh, and uh, this uh, is... Um, uh, Grossbeck Parham, who is an American uh, OBGYN who has spearheaded this program, Mulindi Mwanahamuntu, who is my hero. Uh, these two people are just unbelievable, and the nurses are absolutely staggering in their competence. And with a little bit of PEPFAR money, it did not take a lot, we were able to grow the program at this pace, and we've screened over 160,000 women, and our, our modeling suggests that we've saved 1,000 lives. And, you know, it's possible to do this work and it's possible to do on the back of the PEPFAR gains. What about the impact of violence in regional and national conflicts, a failure to eradicate polio, civil war in Syria, ongoing conflicts in Pakistan and Afghanistan? I'm nervous as heck about the uh, guinea worm eradication work in South Sudan. Are we gonna get there, given the current, current civil war? Anti-gay legislation in Uganda and Nigeria. Now uh, they have... Uh, they have, uh, they have um, a serious problem uh, driving uh, gay men underground. Second Amendment issues in the United States, the gun proliferation, schools, parks, workplaces, bars, homes, I feel so safe. Uh, political extremism and mental instability, we're not doing background checks. Uh, accidents with firearms, we're seeing uh, this in the newspaper once a month. Some two-year-old gets shot by his five-year-old brother, it's unbelievable. And the diversion of firearms to criminals. Uh, trust is fragile. Uh, the way we found Osama bin Laden was by um, uh, having a fake vaccine campaign in the community. This is one of the reasons that the, uh, that the um, um, Taliban is shooting vaccine workers. I don't think that was a smart political move on our part. Uh, we have uh, Pashtun children who, to, whose parents simply don't trust us. Nearly all the polio cases in, in, uh, in, Pol in Pakistan are with the Pashtuns. And there are many, many more. Threats to human health are matched with compelling needs to intervene, and I think I'm gonna skip a slide or two. So some of the challenges, let's end the talk. How do we validate and then deploy major technological advances, transforming systems for greater efficiency and effectiveness? How can we get behavioral models on which to base theory-driven interventions? Uh, can we upgrade our epidemiologic, biostatistical, environmental health sophistication, mathematical models, improve cost-effectiveness reports? Uh, biostatistical innovations we've seen in recent years. Point of care diagnostics, rapid diagnostics, they're not necessarily the same thing. Multi-assay molecular diagnostics and surveillance. Uh, social media, you know, we're doing surveillance based on social media now, which seems to be mimicking uh, what conventional surveillance is giving us, at least for some diseases. Modern GIS, personalized medicine, we have an amazing system at Vanderbilt the so-called bioview and the synthetic derivative in which we're taking people's genomes, we're matching them to their uh, electronic medical record and making research possible that we, we couldn't even imagine before. We have to do more with less. We have uh, health communications that uh, have to be accelerated. I don't know about you, but four-year delays are unacceptable uh, in the current uh, uh, environment. And I'll end by saying we have tensions of individual liberties versus social welfare. Um, Individual liberties. I have a right to bear arms. I, can, I have a right to refuse my vaccines. I have a right to sell unhealthy products. I have a right to burn fossil fuels. I have a right to overuse water versus a social welfare thing. We're really extreme on the individual liberty side, but most of us public health people are thinking about the social welfare side. How are we going to improve the dialogue? The anti-science sentiments in classrooms, Congress, radio, television, internet, churches, the politicization of the public health discourse. You know, I, I was going to go into some detail, but I've lost uh, my time and uh, just remind you that this HIV response, civil liberties for gay and, and uh, lesbian persons, uh, needle exchange program issues all have been politicized. 
So, much of public health is based on tried and true strategies that if maintained will protect the public, STD, TB control, water and sanitation, vector control, workplace safety, health education are just a few. We've got to maintain our uh, vigilance in classic public health. But to make the most effective, efficient use of the explosion of new knowledge and data characteristic of modern science, we have to emulate the fields of biotechnology and information technology. We have to continuously reinvent ourselves and our discipline. I want to thank you for your invitation.